I'm Ranger Mara at Shenandoah National Park. And today, we are doing a virtual Birds of Prey program. A little bit later, a live Bird of Prey is going to help me to explain how our Birds of Prey program uh, works, a little about the history of our program, and about he will show you some of the amazing adaptations of uh, Birds of Prey. In addition, we'll be learning about how these birds are still vulnerable, even though they have wonderful physical and behavioral adaptations, and we'll also be finding out what you and I can do to help birds of prey uh, to survive in the wild and maintain their, their valuable presence in the ecosystem. Shenandoah National Park began its unique birds of prey program in 1986 as a partnership with the newly established Wildlife Center of Virginia, which is uh, located in Waynesboro. It's a wildlife animal hospital. They take in injured animals and try to heal them up, fix them, so they can be returned to the wild. Some of those animals have permanent injuries that prevent them being able to survive in the wild, and some of those become wildlife ambassadors for the Wildlife Center of Virginia, where they go on programs out to the public all over the East. Since the National Park and the Wildlife Center have common interests and missions, protecting wildlife habitats and helping people to understand the value of wildlife in the ecosystem, balanced ecosystems, uh, it was a perfect fit for the park and the Wildlife Center to work together. And so our partnership means that the Wildlife Center would provide the park uh, wildlife ambassadors, these would be raptors or birds of prey, uh, for us to present uh, to the public on regular programs. And uh, we in the park would maintain the daily care, feeding, and health uh, needs of the birds of prey, whereas the Wildlife Center would take care of um, any medical issues that came up, any regular physical exams and vaccinations and that sort of thing. This partnership with the Wildlife Center in Shenandoah National Park is in its 35th year. Over, the time, over that time, park rangers have provided thousands of public programs to many thousands of park visitors where live birds of prey have been helpful in educating visitors about the value of these animals in our ecosystem. So over the years, we've had many different types of wildlife ambassadors. These are all raptors, of course, or birds of prey, but we've had hawks, falcons, and owls. Right now, we're down to just one, and it's a red-tailed hawk, and you're about to meet him. This is Artie, the red-tailed hawk. Artie is a type of a hawk called a buteo. It's a B-U-T-E-O. And these are hawks that have broad wings and a broad tail that helps them to get lift in the air because the way they hunt is from soaring from a distance, so way high up in the air. So it helps for them to have those broad wings and tails and that will help to push them up higher so they don't have to flap their wings as much uh, and they can soar around and look for their, their prey. Uh, Red tails and other uh, buteos here in Shenandoah National Park are uh, broad-winged hawks, which are smaller than red tails, and red-shouldered hawks, which have red shoulders instead of red tails. They're just about as the same size as red tails. The other type of hawk uh, is the accipiter, and representatives of those here in the park are Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks. And these are hawks that have uh, narrower wings and longer tails, and that helps them to be able to make their way through uh, trees around in, inside the forest where they hunt uh, from, from uh, woodland areas instead of uh, hunting from way up high and soaring like the Buteos. Uh, Red-tailed hawks are pretty cosmopolitan in what they eat. They'll eat a wide variety of things. Uh, some of their preferred foods are uh, rabbits, um, squirrels and other rodents, uh, mice and rats, chipmunks, and snakes. Uh, but they also will come to carrion or road-killed animals, and that can be to their detriment. Um, Artie came to us uh, 13 years ago, 
after he was found wandering along the highway um, near near traffic, and he may have been feeding on some roadkill animal. Uh, he was taken to the wildlife center, and there it was discovered that he had two broken bones in his wing. Unfortunately, those bones didn't heal correctly, so he's not able to fully extend that wing. And as you know, that's important for a soaring bird to be able to extend those broad uh, wings. So now Artie is a wildlife ambassador helping us here to spread the word about the value of hawks and other raptors in the ecosystem. Red-tailed hawks illustrate some amazing adaptations that raptors have, and we'll go through some of those. Like all birds, uh, red-tailed hawks have feathers, and they're very light, and the ability to fly is, is an adaptation for this particular type of, of predator. Uh, Red-tailed hawks, like other predators in the park, other hawks, owls, um, eagles, and other um, birds that just may be passing through, um, are able to um, kill prey, and they're top predators. That means they're not preyed on by other top predators. They leave each other alone. Other top predators in the park include our black bears, uh, bobcats, coyotes, uh, two types of foxes. So they are, they're right up there at the top. Their feathers allow them to hunt in a different way from those mammals that are, that are walking around on the ground. So to get off the uh, earth, they need to be light, and their weight is, is pretty lightweight. Uh, if you take a look at him, you might guess how, how much he weighs. He weighs between a pound and a half to two pounds on one of his heavy days. So red-tailed hawks can go up to four pounds, um, but he's on the lighter side. They're a large uh, raptor, the largest hawk species uh, in the east. Their wingspans can be uh, three feet to four feet for, for a large red-tailed hawk. Now, the adaptations that make them different from other birds are two main features. One is on his face, and the other is on the end of his feet. You notice on his face he's got a, a beak like other birds do of course but it's got a hook on the end and it's sharp and that beak is a raptor beak that's how hawks owls and eagles uh, tear their prey think about this red-tailed hawk if he caught a rabbit he would not be able to swallow that rabbit whole so he needs to have that beak to tear the prey into smaller pieces so he can eat it also they can only, um, hawks like this, can only lift about half of their own body weight off of the ground. So they're not going to be able to lift a whole large animal, uh, like a large rabbit, off the ground. So it's going to be important to eat as quickly as he can, and that tearing beak helps them to do that. As long as a raptor is on the ground with prey, it's vulnerable to other top predators coming and stealing that prey. So a fox might want that prey and chase that bird off of it, and the bird might get, get hurt in the process. So it wants to be able to eat as quickly as possible and then get up to a high place in a tree and, uh, and be safe again. The matching body part with, those beak, with, the, with the beak is the sharp curved talons. There are four, one on the end of each toe, and they're sharp on the end so they can kill with those uh, talons, they can stab their prey, but the curved uh, nature of those talons helps them to hold on to the prey to keep it from, from getting away. And so that's the killing part on a raptor. They don't generally kill with their beaks, uh, at least the red-tailed hawks uh, don't, um, but they use those feet. So they can, they can stab, hold, and kill with their feet. They can squeeze with 200 pounds of pressure per square inch. So that's a pretty powerful uh, set of, of uh, killing feet right there. Since red-tailed hawks are beautios, they're soaring hunters, um, about 10 o'clock in the morning after the, the sun has shone on the earth for a while and it heated up that, that, um, that ground, that warm air is going to be rising, and, and we call those thermals, those thermal currents. And birds like red-tailed hawks, turkey vultures, spread their wings, and they'll just get pushed up into the air and uh, high, um, hunt from, from high places. So a uh, red-tailed hawk like this is hunting from a mile up in the air and they have to be able to see very well and that's where another adaptation comes in. Hawks like this can see very sharply, they see in color, 
Both of their eyes are on the front of their face, just like humans. They have binocular vision, so both eyes see the same object, and that helps them to see it sharply. Um, but red-tailed hawks can see about four times better than humans can, so their eyesight is really good. A red tail can see a rabbit on the ground from a mile away. So think about what you can see from a mile away, and I'll bet it's not a rabbit. So excellent eyesight. Now he looks pretty serious. If you take a look at that face, people think hawks and eagles are mean because they have this very serious look, but that's just part of their skull structure. There are uh, two plates that come out over their eyes and it works as a sunshade. Imagine if you're up in the air, hunting from a distance, trying to see and the sun's out and the sun's in your eyes, it's gonna be very hard to see what you're looking at. But if you have a brim of a hat like this or something to shade your eyes, Eye, then you can see what you're looking for and this brow ridge comes out on their skull and covers or goes over their eye and acts as a sunshade so they're not mean in fact red-tailed hawks are among the least aggressive of the raptor species out there but they just look very serious so even though raptors like Artie, the red-tailed hawk here, um, have amazing adaptations, they're still vulnerable. Remember how we said they could be vulnerable to other top predators while they're on the ground? That's something they have to watch out for in the wild. But there are other vulnerabilities that have to do with, with humans. Remember how uh, Artie was injured? We believe he was hit by a car, and that's the way a lot of the raptors that are taken to the Wildlife Center of Virginia um, are injured. Um, in the 2018, um, the Wildlife Center reported 68 red-tailed hawks that came into their center that were injured. And think about that, there's only 52 weeks in a year, right? 68 red-tailed hawks. So, and those are the only, only the ones that, that they know about that were brought into them. So there are um, things that we can do as humans to help these birds so there's not such a large number of, of birds and other wildlife being taken to uh, wildlife centers or hospital, wildlife hospitals like the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Uh, one is to be aware that when you're in a wooded area, there could be wildlife that are coming out of the woods. And if you're on a road in a wooded area, they might come out on that road. In Shenandoah National Park, we have a very low speed limit, 35 miles an hour. And it's important that we observe that when we're driving so that we don't uh, uh, run over animals. We give ourselves time to slow down and stop as an animal crosses the road or as we come around a bend and find an animal on the road or near it. Other ways that we can help them is to preserve their habitat. Uh, Red-tailed hawks need tall trees to nest in, um, but they need open areas to hunt in. They prefer shrubby, open, open fields. Shenandoah National Park is 95% forest, so we've got lots of old, tall trees, plenty of places for them to build their nests, but we don't have a lot of those open field areas for them to hunt in. So sometimes red tails will hunt along the edge of a road that represents the, the type of a, a field area that they will find uh, rodents like mice and things like that in, so they'll hunt there. So we need to be very cautious when we drive. Uh, we need to be aware that raptors and other wildlife can be out there and do our best also to preserve their habitat. If you have a woodlot on your property, that might be a good place for, for hawks and, and other wildlife uh, to survive. If you have a community that uh, is wondering what to do with certain plots of land, you can speak up and, and uh, uh, express interest in wildlife habitat. So these are just little ways that, that you can help to ensure habitat for wildlife, raptors, uh, and help to ensure their uh, presence in a balanced ecosystem. This is a special day for Artie. He is going to the Wildlife Center of Virginia for his beak and talon trimming. We kind of call that his pedicure. He goes regularly um, to have those things done because in captivity, birds aren't as active and they aren't wearing down their, their nails or, or, or beaks as they would um, in the wild. It's just like if you have a, a house pet, a dog or a cat that doesn't you know, get outside very much, um, you're gonna be trimming those, those claws um, pretty regularly. If you have a horse, you know you have the farrier come regularly to trim those hooves because they'll just keep uh, getting overgrown. So,
He's going to the Wildlife Center where their talented uh, staff will um, trim his beak. It's called coping and, uh, and his talons and um, he'll be all ready to go. Look, he's excited, he's ready to go. We're back from the Wildlife Center where Artie just had his pedicure. Uh, he had his beak and talon, talons trimmed by the staff at the Wildlife Center. And when you think about it, a bird's beak and their talons are made out of keratin, which is the same material that our fingernails are made out of. And so just like we need to trim our nails, uh, they need to have their uh, beaks and talons trimmed when they're in captivity like this guy is and not as active as he normally would be in the wild. So thanks to the Wildlife Center staff, Artie's looking pretty spiffy today. Sometimes during our birds of prey programs, uh, people will ask or they'll look at this hawk or an owl, whatever we were using in our program and say, I want one of those. I want to have one of those as a pet. And I would just say, put that idea right out of your head because there are state and federal laws that prohibit possessing a, a bird of prey, uh, their feathers, any body parts like beaks or talons, um, nests or eggs. And that's so that these birds are safe in the wild because we realize what an important part of the uh, balanced ecosystem birds of prey and other raptors are. Now it hasn't always been that way. In the 1880s in Virginia there were set up what they called protective associations and these were solely for um, the purpose of wiping out hawk and owl populations in certain areas. And that's because sometimes those birds would take chickens, other domesticated animals, uh, small birds, game birds such as quail, and some other game animals such as rabbits that people wanted to hunt. In all the way up into the 1920s, the different counties in Virginia would pay a bounty on every scalp that you brought in of a hawk or an owl. It was 50 cents per scalp, so that was pretty good incentive to go out there and kill uh, raptors. And in 1925, in early, excuse me, in early October, there was a newspaper account of uh, hundreds of hawks that had landed on High Top Mountain, which is now within the boundaries of Shenandoah National Park. Early October, these birds were obviously stopping through on their migration south as they came through a low place or a gap in the mountains to rest overnight and begin their journey southward again in the morning. Well, when people found out that hawks were there, they descended on that field. And by the end of the evening, 320 hawks were killed. One man killed 38. So you could see the incentive of those bounties on getting people to kill hawks and owls and other raptors as well. In 1929, in uh, Hawk Mountain, Pennsylvania, that's just north of where we are, 1,500 hawks were killed on one day. There were so many that they were piled three feet deep in some places. Now, in 1930, the state of Virginia ended its bounty program. So ideas were starting to change. People were beginning to realize the value of raptors in the ecosystem. And in 1934, Hawk Mountain became the world's first raptor sanctuary. So we know how important raptors are in their place in the wild. If you would like to work with raptors, I would suggest volunteering at a wildlife center or with a licensed uh, wildlife rehabilitator. You might also think about a career as a veterinary technician or a veterinarian or as a wildlife uh, rehabilitator, um, or even as a park ranger. Sometimes you get to work with, with uh, wildlife like this. If you're interested in helping out with wildlife here in Virginia, you can contact the Wildlife Center of Virginia at their website, www.wildlifecenter.org. Meantime, I hope you get a chance to see some raptors in the wild, and some of the best places for doing that are on our 
protected public lands such as our national wildlife refuges and our national parks like Shenandoah. I hope you've enjoyed our virtual Birds of Prey program. I hope you come away with a little better understanding about the value and importance of raptors in our ecosystem, their wonderful adaptations that allow them to survive in the wild and ways that you can help to protect them. I hope you join us on another of our virtual ranger programs here at Shenandoah. Until then, this is Ranger Mara with Artie the Red-Tailed Hawk at Shenandoah National Park. Bye, Artie. Say bye, Artie.